is part of a larger project um, that is uh, funded by the Leverhulme Trust and the, the bigger project itself is trying to look at human coast environmental interactions in this particular area in, um, in Denmark uh, called the Lindfjord and uh, my PhD mainly is about the, uh, doing state livestock analysis on bone collagen to look at dietary changes through time so in this area, I went around and I collected bone samples from around this, this fjord, Lynn fjord. Um, my samples cover a time span of almost 5,000 years from the late Mesolithic up to the Viking Age. So we can track uh, changes through time. And if we look at the, you know, the, the environment here, there is a lot of water. <laughs> there is um, access to open marine waters over here in the North Sea. There's less marine waters uh, to the east in the Katakot, which connects further to the Baltic. And of course, inside the Lindfjord itself, it differs in salinity um, to brackish. Um, so there's quite a lot of, um, there's a big aquatic component, and it's quite likely that people in the past were exploiting these aquatic resources. And this is something we also see in the archaeology. So from the Mesolithic, there's loads of shell middens and fish nets. Uh, particularly the Erdogola culture is famous um, in northern Germany, but also in Denmark. Um, in the early Neolithic, we also have shell middens and fish nets. So this actually, that sort of aquatic exploitation extends further into the early Neolithic. Uh, the remaining periods of the Neolithic, there's far less evidence for aquatic exploitation, except for one period that's called um, the pitted ware culture but it's not as pronounced as it is in Sweden, where they sort of go back to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, the Bronze Age, there's even less evidence for um, aquatic exploitation. However, with the onset of the Iron Age, we see again large shell middens appear and uh, fish bone accumulations, especially in northern Jutland, which is the part that we are looking at. So I'm going straight into the carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes, so you can see it. Um, I have three Martin. Three Mesolithic individuals here and here too, and they have quite obviously a marine component in their diet. Then the Neolithic and Bronze Age individuals are all down here with low carbon, low nitrogen, suggesting a very terrestrial-based uh, diet. Um, I have two individuals up here. They were reported as juveniles, so I'm assuming that's a breastfeeding signal. However, with the onset of the Iron Age, that's all this and the different divisions within the Iron Age. We see this rise in nitrogen, whereas the carbon stays virtually the same. So this could be a number of things. It could be manuring. There's a manuring effect that can raise your nitrogen levels. Uh, it could also be freshwater fish consumption. Um, or it could even be small amounts of marine protein that won't have such a pronounced effect on your carbon, but they might raise uh, the nitrogen levels. So in that sense, I was thinking it might be useful to look at another isotopic system, hydrogen. And hydrogen stable isotopes are not new, sorry. Uh, people have been doing this for years in the forensics and uh, animal migration studies where they were using hair and feathers, which is keratin. Um, in keratin tissues, the hydrogen ratios are controlled by food and water intake. And because it's controlled by that, um, um, it's closely connected to precipitation and therefore geographic location, making it so useful for migration studies. Now, in bone collagen, the hydrogen, especially in large mammals, seems to be more governed by uh, food intake, and therefore there has been studies have seen a connection with trophic level. And this is probably related to the fact that bone has a much uh, slower turnover rate compared to hair. It, it represents a much longer time span, whereas hair grows a lot faster. Um, it's probably also body size related, so you would try to avoid doing hydrogen on uh, small rodents because they are probably um, have some sort of seasonal influence. So you would use large mammals, humans. Because there's a 100% mass difference between the two isotopes we use in hydrogen, we can expect larger trophic level differences compared to carbon or nitrogen, which is something only in the range of one per mil for carbon. And this in, in the literature, this is anything between three and six per mil in nitrogen. Now, and there's only a few studies that use archaeological bone material. And this is because hydrogen is actually quite difficult to measure. A 
about 20% of the hydrogen atoms in bone collagen, in organic even, uh, exchanges with hydrogen in the atmosphere, atmosphere water vapor. And this is because functional groups in the collagen protein um, contain so-called labile hydrogen atoms. So any, any hydrogen that, that is not connected to carbon can exchange with the atmosphere. This means that if you would analyze the same sample in a lab here and in a lab in Belfast, you would get different values because you have different atmospheric pressures governing those two laboratories. Even analyzing the same sample in the same lab but six months apart might give a different value. So we are dealing with an exchangeable fraction and a non-exchangeable fraction. And the exchangeable is useless, that's something that doesn't mean anything, but we need to measure both in order to get to this non-exchangeable fraction that contains absolute or true values. Um, and this, in order to get to this, we need to let our samples equilibrate with water of known isotopic composition in a controlled manner. So um, this does not mean letting your samples stand in the lab and equilibrate with the lab, lab environment because this can change seasonally and per year. We need to do this control. One way is doing a comparative equilibration method um, where you have your samples and one standard of which you know the isotopic composition equilibrate with water of known isotopic composition. And because you know this standard, that's one thing, you know this standard and you know the offset that the standard will have, you can then apply it to your samples <coughs> to correct them. But this you can only do with a 100% matrix match. So this is what they were doing in those animal migration studies because they have a standard that consists of keratin and that's a 100% matrix match. But collagen is not the exact same as keratin, so we can't use this approach. So what we will do instead is a so-called two-stage equilibration process, as um, suggested by Bowen et al. There's one other thing I need to point out. Um, samples and reference materials need to be analyzed in the same run. But our samples are actually solids, whereas most of the, um, the reference materials are waters, so they're liquids. And you can analyze both on your IRMS, uh, but not in the same run. So you either use your, your auto sampler or your syringe for your liquid speed. They have trouble in both. Um, and if you load your water samples in these capsules, they will equilibrate within minutes, so that's very difficult. Now, not too long ago, Key et al. developed these cold welded, uh, sealed silver tubes that you see here. They're very tiny. Um, and inside, there's water of known isotopic composition that doesn't exchange with the environment, which is great. So you can just load them together with your samples in the auto sampler and pretend they're solids while inside is water with known isotopic composition. You can buy these from the USGS. Yes, it's very good. So what do we need? We need two sealable desiccators, uh, silica crystals, a vacuum pump, the silver capsules to load your samples in, and you need two waters that isotopically differ by more than 100 per mil. So I bought USGS 49, which is almost 400, minus 400 per mil, and we use local water um, from the Moore Mountains that was collected when there was snow three years ago, I think. Um, also important is a zero blind auto sampler. This is a auto sampler that the moment you put your samples in, the carousel will seal it with helium. So it will purge away all the atmosphere that is in there. So your samples won't exchange back while they're waiting in the carousel to be analyzed. So that's, that's pretty essential. Um, and of course, your reference materials need to cover the expected sample value range that you expect. So I expect my samples to fall anywhere between minus 50 and plus 100. So I use these three reference materials, PSMO, SLAP2, and UCO4. Um, and those are those silver, those silver tubes. So we follow the regular collagen extraction protocol. Um, important here is that samples need to be homogenized. And I tried this using a ball mill, but that doesn't work very well. I tried making them brittle with liquid nitrogen also didn't work very well. So in the end, I just ended up using more tech pestle to grind them down. Um, samples are loaded in uh, silver capsules. And for each original sample, you will split it into two. And then you have one subsample that goes into desiccator A with water A, in this case, the OSTS 49. And the other subsample will go into the other desiccator. Um, these samples stay in there for four days to equilibrate with the water that we put in there. After four days, the water is removed, we add the silica gel, and we uh, evacuate the, the desiccators. They stay in there for four days, for seven days, sorry. 
then the samples need to be loaded fairly quickly into the auto sampler where they can remain safely. And each run consisted of uh, four reference materials, so um, four FISMO, four SLAP, four UCO4, followed by two blanks, then ten samples, two blanks, and again, three reference materials in the um, elemental uh, analyzer. Now, because in the end, you end up with two sets of measurements, basically. One from the one desiccator and one from the other desiccator. So you will, uh, but you can use a formula to, in the end, get back to that original, that true value. So unfortunately, I only have one batch done because the iron is broke in the spring and I'm still waiting. So hopefully I'll be able to do more. But these are 10 humans I've done so far. And even here, we can already see some interesting things. For example, these two blue ones are, so this is a carbon and nitrogen plot, and this is nitrogen against hydrogen. And uh, the blue ones are iron age. And we can see here, keep losing my mouth. Um, that they're quite high in nitrogen. However, if they plot lower in hydrogen than all the other samples, which would suggest that, they, that these humans were feeding on a lower trophic level than all the others, suggesting that their nitrogen level may have been influenced, possibly by manure. So, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting because I was expecting them to eat fish or anything. Um, also interesting is that there's a couple of Neolithic individuals, the red ones, uh, have higher hydrogen values than the others. Um, so there might be some fish in those two, uh, in these two individuals. And a final thing I want to point out is that this Viking Age individual, which is about two and a half per mil higher in terms of carbon, plots actually more than 50 per mil higher in hydrogen than all the others. And this is exactly the, uh, that larger trophic level range that you can expect uh, in the hydrogen isotopic system. Of course, I want to do more, analyze more human samples, but maybe even more important is the fact that I need to add animals for a proper baseline, because these are human individuals that are centuries apart. Um, so yeah, getting, getting a good baseline using animal bones is definitely impressive. So that's what I'll be doing in the near future. But hopefully I've shown that hydrogen doesn't need to be difficult anymore, especially since those silver tubes are now developed, that made it so much easier as long as you have the right equipment and um, an IRMS that works. Thank you.